I have an object that is going to roll down an incline. We will assume no slipping. So perfect roll. It has, so because there's no slipping, if we look at the forces acting on this, I have normal force, I have friction, static friction, I have normal force, and weight. Those are the three forces acting on it. So the question is, which, one, which of these forces are actually doing work? Well, the normal force, if you think about the spot right here, that normal force is acting on a spot on the, on the ball, so acting on, let's say, that spot right there. How far does that spot, how long is that normal force acting on that spot? In the instant. Okay, therefore, not really any work's being done there because the displacement caused by the normal force is minimal to that spot. Friction, also acting on that spot, it's not doing any work. There's no sliding going on. If there were sliding, then yes, there would be some loss due to friction, but friction's not doing any work for a very similar explanation or reason. Weight is constant. Weight is doing work. However, when we um, when we were doing force diagrams, mm -hmm. and we essentially, we, we had to de decompose the vectors that weren't working with our coordinate axes. Right. So then the weight that's that's pushing it down, mm -hmm. that's what's pushing it down there. Yes. Yeah, the component of it. Right. All right. However, we don't need to break it up into components because we're going to use energy. The only thing doing work is weight. And what do we know about weight as a force? It's mass times gravity. Uh, Acceleration is gravity. Okay. True. I was thinking in terms of that work energy thing. Conservative or non-conservative? Yes, it is. All right. So energy is conserved because the non-conservative forces aren't doing anything. Aren't doing any work, I should say. All right. So initial energy equals final energy. My kinetic initial plus potential initial equals kinetic final plus potential final. I'm about to ask that question. I shouldn't even have to warn you. But here we go. Course of angels, that's the target. What's the formula for kinetic energy? One half mv squared. That was nice. Initial squared plus m. Oh, sorry to spoil it. What's the formula for potential energy? The torque. The one associated with weight. And mass times gravity. I assume uh, you just stopped as opposed to finished. Yeah. Okay. All right. This should look somewhat familiar. And now the question is, what can we? Oh, well, actually, there is something else. This is the kinetic energy of an object that is going in a straight line. We have something that's rolling. on ramp. This is object rolling down the ramp. We have two types of kinetic energy we're working with here. We've got the linear kinetic energy, that which is, deals with what the center of mass is doing, and then we have the rotational kinetic energy. I'm going to rewrite the right-hand side here just to put the energies together, the kinetic energies together. Uh, no, that's the initial. This is final squared plus one half. M V final squared plus the G initial final. Now I don't have mass in every term, so I just can't get rid of it yet. All right. So what's zero?
Uh, do we know the height? Uh, it is. No. <laughs> you want numbers? Uh, I was just thinking out of my head. Of it. I don't. Does it, I assume it matters, so I think we need to know it. But are you? Are you, you want just, a, you want a number? Uh, we can just keep it at H. But I was just asking the question. We'll make it capital H. In a problem like this, typically, yes, you do know the height. What? That's just started up here. It doesn't work from that off. Okay. It is starting at rest. Uh, I did not say that explicitly, but at least one of you read my mind on that one. is zero, is the other one have to be zero, I assume? Not necessarily, uh, if it's spinning in place, I like but we're assuming there's no slipping going on, so it would not spin in place. Okay. They're in the Ruth Goldberg test, uh, it is spinning at the, I do have a disconnect between spinning and the linear motion at one point in that. Is is this a situation where we can set some part of it? No, never mind. Um, of spring for like where we can like set a certain area at zero, like set the initial height at zero. Yep. Can we do that? Because potential energy always has is really is that formula that we generally spout out plus some constant, and since that constant can be anything. Uh, we can set zero equal to anywhere. Right, okay, so set the where it starts, its initial height at zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it just made things a lot harder for us. <laughs> All right, it has no energy. zero is equal to one half i omega final squared plus one half m v final squared plus m g negative big h. Although there's nothing wrong with at all with Ibrahim setting zero at the top, absolutely nothing at all. Uh, I think most textbooks would set zero at the bottom. So he's a rebel. That's bad news. Uh, that was a Thieves to Adventure reference. I'm not saying it was a recognition of it. All right, so I. This is the moment of inertia. There's specific formulas for it. Uh, it depends on what we want to treat this as, but remember that the general pattern for those is some number times m r squared. So it is two fifths is if it's a solid sphere, two thirds if it's a hollow sphere, one half if it's a, if it's a disc, all spinning about the uh, normal axis. So I'm just gonna leave it generically as k and then we can make up what that object is later. So that's, what is that called? Is there like a name for it? Oh, that number up front? Yeah. I actually have, it. I've not heard a name for it. It is related to how the mass is distributed. The more the mass is distributed to the outside, the closer it is to one. So mass, and then it has a component from the circumference formula? Uh, then it's, because remember that if we went to the non-calculus long form, it moment of inertia is just the sum of m sub i, r sub i squared. So okay. m r squared is already, okay. it's built into it. Uh, here we go. Yeah. And that would be a pi in there. So I got one half times whatever the number is, depending on the shape, uh, omega 
Oops. times the mass of the object times r squared omega squared plus one half m v final squared plus m g negative h. Let's go ahead. Minus m g negative h. We now have mass in every term. We can now get rid of mass. So this is why the mass, or if you're all roughly in the same place, I guess if we multiply everything by g, the weight, uh, but the mass does not matter. It cancels out. We got one other piece here. What's r squared omega squared? R squared, omega squared, something. It is something. Something that's relevant to this problem. Zero. If it's all generically equal to zero, then nothing ever spins. I've never seen anything spin. The sun does not go around the earth. The earth does not go around the sun. Huh. Yeah, we just sit in place. So anyway, what's the relationship between arc length and angle? If I have something round. Circles. Radius. So I have R, S, and theta. What's the relationship between them? S equals R theta. Uh, arc length. So, if we do change with respect to time, so change in s is equal to r change in theta. There's no delta in front of r because it's a circle, r constant. And then divide by time. What is distance over time? Distance over time. Velocity. I'm going to pick on that one. Speed. Sorry. Yes, speed. <laughs> And change in theta over change in time? Or lost? No. Angular speed. Angular speed. V is equal to R omega. So this R omega becomes V squared. So we've got one half K V squared plus one half V squared plus, uh, minus, I'm just going to bring that over to the other side, equals GH. The radius doesn't matter. Um, so, with the r squared and the omega squared, that just turns in just into normal speed, like v squared. squared. Yes. Okay. This does assume no slipping. If it slips, then that relationship falls apart. But if it's not slipping, that relationship holds. Okay. And so now we're left with one half, oops, I changed my k there, k plus one v squared is equal to gh. So the only thing that is different, if, there, if this were box on ramp sliding down a frictionless ramp, k would be zero. There's no rotation going on and you basically have the problem. Uh, you have the solution to it. But with rolling going on, we have this k factor here that deals with the distribution of mass that does affect how fast it's rolling. And so v, we just crank through it, it'd be 2gh over k square root. So if that is a solid ball, then I get the square root of 2gh over Two fifths, which is the square root of five g h. Um, will we be expecting? Oh, oh, wait a second. That's k plus one. Plus one. Just 
square root of 2gh over 7 fifths. There we go. That would be more familiar. So 10gh over 7 square root. I knew it had to be smaller than the freaking most little roller. Jackie, we're asking a question that I seem to have completely ignored. <laughs> um, will we be expected to remember? I don't know how many there are, but it just seems like there are a lot. The numbers or the k values? No, no. On a quiz or test, I would like, give you the and formulas. How did we go from gh equals one half kv squared plus one half v squared to gh equals one half k plus one v squared? Uh, Common factors here, I got a half common to both of them, and I have v squared common to both of them, so I factor them out. Okay. And so if I factor them out of this, I'm left with k. Mm -hmm. If I factor them out of this, I'm left with one. Okay. Would it make more sense if I'd written it as one half v squared k plus one? Is that? I'm just a little confused where the one came from. It's, this is times one. Okay. So that's. So, well, what you're saying is that when you factored out 12, 12, I mean, not 12, when you factor out 1 half v squared, you can't just get rid of the, the, the extra term? Yeah. No, you no, can't. No. The, the math people are saying no. Not how that works. Yes. Can't spell anymore. All right, so the size of it goes away, the mass of it goes away. It all depends upon how the mass is distributed. All right, so this is it from an energy point of view. I'm going to do a slightly different take on the energy point of view, uh, more conceptual. Are there questions before I launch into a, a different explanation of it? All right, so when the thing's at the top of the ramp, it has, it's all potential energy in this situation. It starts at rest. If it's rolling, okay, it's got some kinetic in there, but it has this potential, which is gonna get converted into kinetic. I have two types of kinetic here. I've got the linear kinetic, which is how fast that center of mass is going down the ramp, and then I've got rotational kinetic. The bigger K is, the closer it is to a hoop, then, more energy is going into, more of the potential energy gets transferred into getting it to rotate, which means there's less energy left over to get it to actually go down the ramp. And so the bigger K is, the smaller V is. Yeah, it's that also of an explanation. You can see you're all enthralled. <laughs> I know, that, that look right there, that, Questions for I erase. Justin. So I equals K in March plus, right? Generically. And then K is a specific value. That K M R squared, I doubt if textbooks put it in there. They usually are very specific to here's the shape, here's that number that's gonna be there. There's a lab I've done where if it is a solid ball, it is two-fifths. If it's a hollow ball, it's two-thirds. So therefore, if you take an object and roll it down a ramp and see how fast it's going at the bottom, well, you know what the two extremes are. It's either solid or hollow or the two extremes. And by seeing how fast it's going, you can come up with a prediction for how thick it actually is. And I, I've done this uh, as a lab, and it's been a while since I've done it, because sometimes people would come out with answers based upon the data where the inside was bigger than the outside. And although you Doctor Who fans, it's possible there. 
generally not accepted here. Is there any kind of relationship between the closer k is to one and the shape of the object? Yeah, the more mass is towards the outside, the the closer it is to one. So since this has a lot more mass towards the distributed towards the inside, this is going to have a smaller k value. This is one half m r squared, and this is a lot closer to one m r squared. So the disk would win this race. In the case of the small one and the large one, although they're both hoops, uh, proportionally, this thickness is larger compared to the actual radius than this is, and so this one should win slightly, be slightly faster. Other questions before I talk about how I somewhat have misled you? How so? Are there other questions first? Oh, that was the question. <laughs> All right, so how have I misled you? If I have an object that's rolling, and you can be on a flat surface, and it's static friction, so it is rolling, perfect roll. Can we say What's the pivot point? Can we say it's rolling this way? <laughs> what is the pivot point? Axis of rotation. Dead set. No. Yes. The part that's touching the table? Yes. When I did that last problem, if there were, I said if it's a solid ball, so a solid sphere, that the moment of inertia would be 2 fifths m r squared. But that assumes that the solid sphere is rotating about the center. And now I'm claiming that it was actually rotating about this point right here. Right, you did do it. You did do it. So, did I lie to you? Well, no. Yeah. I mean, you would never. Yeah, it's not a little more to it. Although it is a dream.